I'm Glenn Studebaker. Uh, I'm going to switch gears slightly and talk about insect control. And there are a lot of interesting cover crops, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit. There, you know, soybean has a lot of insects in it, uh, but not a whole lot that cause a lot of problems. I mean, it, it varies from year to year. You know, we got seedling pests, stem feeders, defoliators, and you know, the really the big ones are probably the pod feeders. Uh, but with the interest in cover crops, and I'll have a lot of slides on this, but this, you know, uh, hit my mind while you were talking. Uh, I think cover crops are great. As an entomologist, some of the stuff, issues we've run into is if you're going to switch gears, go to a cover crop, don't forget the bugs. Because uh, sometimes they, they can actually help reduce insect problems. Sometimes we've seen where they've created insect problems. It all comes down to what we call a green bridge. You got green matter out there, that's what the bugs are feeding on, especially stuff like cutworms, some of the caterpillar pests, think bugs are another one that uh, we have actually seen cause problems later in the season uh, if you don't break that green bridge. And I know sometimes you have to plant straight into the green material. Uh, and if you do, be aware that there might be cutworms. You know, I've known a lot of growers that no-till corn, plant straight into that, and that material uh, and a lot of them, you know, in some areas, just go ahead and put out a pyrethroid behind the planter because cutworms are so thick in some of that stuff and they'll come right in there. Well, what you do is you kill the grass and the weeds and then here comes the corn up and off. And same with beans and some of the things. So keep that in mind. What we like to see is, is uh, uh, a good two weeks, if you can, in between there to give that material time to die off. The bugs, if they don't have anything to eat, will die and then move on. But sometimes you don't have that luxury. Uh, but just keep that in mind. We have had situations that were disasters where people planted uh, a nice blend of cover crop and they were really, really late getting it burned down and they, they had uh, big issues later on. So it's a learning curve. They're great, great for weed management. I think they have a great place in, in doing things, uh, but we need to keep uh, some of those things in mind. You talked about you put a seed treatment on all your, all your beans. A lot of people are going that. And with the cover crop, that is, may not be a bad a bad idea uh, because of some of the issues that you get in there. And where we run into, especially in rice rotations, is grape colaspis can be an issue in, in soybeans and in rice. But they also help control some of these early season pests like three corn of alpha hopper. Thrips aren't a big issue on soybeans, but then bean leaf beetle can be from year to year. And uh, that is one of the things you got to look at. And this is the shot where. Uh, so I think this is a cruiser seed treatment right here, bean leaf beetle. And see, early on, they do help suppress some of those things. So that's a benefit. Uh, you know, that's something you got to look at in your own situation, in your own operation, as to whether or not what you, know, you need one of those. If you had an issue with some of those things in the past, uh, you might. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about caterpillar pests because that's really probably our, one of our number one issues. They feed on the foliage, but they also feed on the pods. And uh, it was not uh, several years ago. We you could run a sweep net through a field and, of soybeans, and uh, you never seen anything like that, have y'all? <laughs> uh, you know, we we uh, we put out pheromone traps. This is a bollworm trap, and we see situations where we have lots of these, especially where corn acreage, grain sorghum acreage is increased. These things come off of that. Uh, one of our issues this past year, we had a lot of grain sorghum in Arkansas. That's pretty good at rearing out a bunch of, of uh, corn earworm that moves to our soybeans and cotton and stuff like that later on. Uh, but uh, this is still what a lot of us consider to be probably the worst pest of soybeans, the corn earworm. They, they, they're a pod feeder. They'll feed on the foliage too, but their big issue is eating these big holes in the pods and that, that directly affects yield. One of the things that we did do, uh, we're implementing this year, and it's not just in Arkansas, but all the Mid-South states in particular, we worked together on a project uh, for several years now. Uh, we have changed our threshold. It's a dynamic threshold. Everybody's, you know, we, we talk about this for years, uh, but, you know, our thresholds, we always have a number. Nine earworms for 25 sweeps and, and soybeans. Well, what about soybean prices? When the, when the prices are high and, the, and we get a lot more per bushel, uh, shouldn't that threshold be lower? Well, yeah, it should, but we never knew exactly what that, what that threshold should be. So uh, this new threshold is based on prices and the cost of control. So you know, if you've got a high cost of control and low, so low soybean prices coming up, well, your threshold is going to be higher. If it's the other way around, your threshold is going to be lower. And, and when I'm talking about control costs, it's not just the cost of the insecticide, it's going to be what it costs to put it out there as well. So that's uh, adding both of those in there. Uh, but like I said, this is a, we have a, a group of entomologists that we've worked together for years here in the Mid-South, and it's Mississippi, Tennessee, uh, Arkansas, Louisiana. 
in, uh, in the Boot Hill, Missouri. And uh, this is at least five years of data. Well, why did it take us five years or more to do this? This was hard work. Uh, trying to, you know, y'all get be uh, worms in your beans just by planting them. We go put them out there and they die. So we, 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 the worms won't stay alive. So it, it took a lot of a lot of work, but we were able to do it since this uh, this group was working together. Uh, we, we feel like we've got a real strong data set on this, and it, it looks really good. Basically, what we're going to have, and this is what we've got in Arkansas. Every state may be implementing it a little bit different how you can use it. Uh, but we basically just have a table in the front of our uh, insecticide guide and, and soybeans there. And we've got a threshold calculator for sweep net and one for, for uh, uh, shake seed as well. But basically what it is is the cost of control per acre is across the top. And what you uh, either booked your beans for or what, the, uh, what, what you think the value of your beans is going to be whenever you go to harvest. You know, as you, so you can see this number gets lower when you got $15 beans as opposed to uh, six dollar beans that the number is quite a bit higher depending on what your cost and also depends on how much it's going to cost you to control that uh, this is an example you know our, our our old threshold was about this is per 25 sweeps was about nine per 25 so you know basically what we had was something around ten dollar beans and around you know 16 to 18 dollar uh, uh control cost well that's static like i said so if you know if, if beans aren't worth as much well that threshold should be different than that and this basically how this would work. Uh, you know, if your control cost combined is going to be eighteen dollars an acre, and you're going to get, you think you're going to get seven dollars, uh, your, your threshold will be twelve point six uh, earworms per twenty-five sweeps. You know, so uh, but you know, if you're going to get fifteen dollars, see that that threshold is about half that. It's five point nine. So that's a big difference. Uh, so it really kind of comes into what uh, you know what you know you think your beans are going to be. You know, we had had good bean prices. I think they're going to be about eight or nine dollars somewhere in there right now. So, you know, threshold will be about about ten if it's uh, on, on the sweet net. And this is average. You know, we I always recommend scouting a field at least once a week. You want to check several spots in the field. Sweet net's probably one of the easiest things to use in, in a soybean field for sample for stink bugs, uh, earworms, defoliators, and a lot of other things. Uh, and we also have one for drop cloth. Again, the same same issue here as far as uh, value and then co control cost. But this is the number of worms you get per row foot. Uh, so it's so a per foot of row. So you know, with the shake sheet drop cloth, you're going to shake those those plants over the row, and you can get an estimate of what the number per row foot. Uh, again, our threshold has been around in Arkansas one to two per row foot, uh, but it's, it'll be uh, it'll be different now with uh, with this calculator. Again, uh, same example, it'll be 1.7 per row foot. About, which is pretty close to what our threshold has been. Uh, you can see the change isn't as big because we're down to numbers per row foot, not number per 25 sweeps. But again, it could be as small as half of one per row foot to as many as over, over two per row foot. So uh, don't know a lot of people that still use the shake sheet and sweep them so much easier. Y'all don't use shake sheets and soybeans, do you? <laughs> the consultants in the room. Uh, I don't either if I don't have to, but you know, some there are some that I still get questions about. Well, how much would that be on a shake sheet? So uh, that is something that we are rolling out again. Like I said, uh, all uh, I think all five states in the mid south are rolling this out in their in their recommendations guide uh, this coming year. So uh, just keep that in mind. We have a real good data set, uh, but you know, we're talking about bugs, and there are we talk about. Insects, how do we manage them in, in, in a field, especially soybeans? There's things that we can do. And uh, a lot of things that we can do are cultural, such as planting early, uh, getting your crop in early, like you talked about, helps a lot. Those earlier planted fields sometimes yield better because they don't have as much bug pressure later on. They're not, those bugs aren't going to go to that field. They like to go to those later planted fields because they look better, they're greener. And, you know, if the field's uh, pretty uh, much uh, uh, yield, uh, uh, matured out they're not going to go to it another thing with bow worms in particular they uh, like wide middles if there's bare ground between those rows those moths are attracted to those kind of fields so one of the cultural things you can do this and not even have to use an insecticide is to plant with narrower middles uh, a lot of people plant on 38 inch middles but if you get it planted early you know that, that you get that crop to lap over a little bit some of the narrow row widths do do uh, you know once you get that canopy to close it's that it's that bare ground in between is what they're really attracted to we don't know why but that's what they seem to go to and another thing is to avoid unnecessary applications uh, particularly pyrethroids with insects we have the luxury that you can go out there and you can find the bugs 
you can see the, the damage. I know with diseases, it's a lot harder to tell what, what's out there, and sometimes you have to put out preventative applications. But uh, we very rarely recommend a preventative application for, uh, for an insect because we can come out there and, and, and scout the, the, uh, the damage or scout for the bugs. Uh, we've got kudzu bug in Arkansas now, and uh, uh, it's just in eastern Arkansas, basically across just across the river right now. So I want to talk a little bit about that, but it it's finally made it over here. Uh, it is a, a you know a pest that's moved across the south, and coming over here. It likes legumes, and again, this could be an issue if you've got a legume cover crop in the field, depending on whatever, if you, especially with soybeans, they could be a bridge to carry those over. Uh, don't know a lot of them that are. Uh, but they feed on the sap. They don't really feed on the pods. Yield loss is usually because of stress and just the sheer numbers that they get. Uh, so what our you know recommendation, this is pretty much I think the recommendation in other states as well, is you know we look at treating for nymphs. When you start to find nymphs, adults will fly into the field and there might be gobs of them out there, but until they start to reproduce, they usually don't cause a lot of a lot of issues. Uh, spraying for them, they'll a lot of times come right back in. But they are easy to control. That's the one good thing. Pyrethroids especially do a pretty good job. Uh, this is the one pest that planting early actually increases your problems. They do tend to go more to early planted uh, beans. So that is something. But again, it's not something that's not manageable. Uh, what we're trying to do in Arkansas is keep people from panicking, thinking that we need to go out and spray. Because we're going to find fields with a lot of adults in them this year, guys. And it's going to be tempting to, oh, well, we need to clean this up. Growers are going to be scared. Uh, but, you know, really we need to watch for those nymphs, and those nymphs are those uh, little fuzzy things. There's the eggs and there's the nymphs come out of there. So they're not, not, hard to, not hard to identify, not hard to find. Like I said, the pyrethroids all do a real good job. This is our uh, performance ratings. A lot of the insecticides do a decent job on kudzu, but I just keep that in mind. The foliators, I, I, you know, our, our threshold changes with the foliators, it always has 40% but prior to flowering. A soybean plant has tremendous capacity to compensate for uh, <coughs> foliage loss. So we've, and I've tested this several times where we went through and actually pulled leaves off of plants. And I'm, we're real comfortable that this 40% prior to flowering is a very strong threshold. Now, when we start getting to the reproductive stages, that's when we got we dropped that down to 25%. Uh, well, I do a lot of our scouting schools, you know, you know learn what 25% and 40% defoliation looks like. You know, here's 40% and here's around 20. Uh, so, you know, don't overestimate, just kind of need to calibrate uh, what, what that looks like. And of course, stink bugs are not always a yearly issue, but they can be an issue. And this is one that we had pop up in some fields of corn where they had triticale and some other stuff as a, as a cover crop and they let it stay out there too long before they burned it down. And it built up stink bugs and then they went into the corn. And, uh, and you can see the same thing with soybeans. So that's one of those things we got to manage that cover crop uh, properly. Uh, one per row foot, nine per 25, easy to remember. One of the things we did have done, and again, it's some of this uh, uh, Mid-South group that we work with, uh, we have come up with a, uh, a the threshold, and this changes as the, as the plant progresses. Uh, it used to be we, we, we said nine per 25 all the way to maturity, uh, you know, back before 2009. Now, basically, what we're saying is nine per 25 sweeps up through R6. When we hit R6, they're not causing as much damage and we double that threshold. So it's 18 per 25 when you hit R6 in that field uh, and up to R6.5. Once we get to R6 and a half, we have not been able to measure yield loss from stink bugs. So you can kind of let them go. So you save an application at the end of the season. I like that. That's a, that's a tough one though. It, yeah. When, when you've got the stink bugs there and, and, <laughs> and the grower is sitting there saying, well, stink bugs are going berserk. They're eating right. up. Right. And you're saying, don't spray them. And, and what I would recommend is, is if you can, get him to leave a strip or two and not, not spray and spray some more. That's what we have to do a lot of times. We have to do that with, with a lot of these because I'll be honest with you, it scares me too when yeah, I'm in the field. Yeah, I mean, well, it does us. But we've, we've done quite a bit of research and, uh, you know, once you're past R6 and a half, they're still out there, uh, but uh, they're not causing any yield loss. It may be a little bit of a quality issue, but, you know, and that's the difference. This is not talking about quality. This is just basically yield loss. Now, if you're worried about quality, you probably got to clean them up. But I would, if I was to hit R6.5, clean them up. And be, if there's a bunch out there, you're close to R6.5, clean them up and be done with it. But still, we, we know we can withstand twice as many bugs at that point. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. And that does help. You know, it's all about you know, bean prices aren't as high as they have been. So we've got to 
save a little money somewhere. And this is a, this is one area I think we can uh, we can save money. Uh, like I said, you know, we may see a lot of them out there, but at one point, and sometimes the pods are feeding on them at that point aren't, aren't harvestable anyway. Uh, let's keep that in mind. So again, you know, kind of uh, remember that threshold changes. Another thing about stink bugs, you know, if it's green and southern green, the pyrethroids still do an excellent job of controlling these things. If it's a brown stink bug, about the only pyrethroid that works is going to be brigade, which is there's a lot of generics in that thing. It's bifenthrin is the active ingredient, or you know, go with acephate or indigo uh, you know, or tank mix if you're going to have browns in there. A lot of times you may have a mixed population. Uh, Again, you know, late season, if we get a lot of them, a lot of times you're going to spray more than once. Uh, remember, your, your, uh, your species really depends on what, what you're going to choose to use out there. And those late instar nymphs are the most damaging. Why? Because they're bigger, they feed a lot, and they can't fly, so they're going to stay there in the field. Uh, adults will fly out sometimes, but those, those late instar nymphs are the ones we really got to watch for. All right. I want to talk about pesticide resistance real quick. You know, uh, these... Uh, it, it, repeated exposure to pesticides is really what causes this. You know, we spray the field. If we don't have a threshold, we're exposing those insects, those diseases, whatever they are, and we develop resistance. This is true with weeds, insects, doesn't matter what it is. We are seeing resistance uh, in some of these uh, products that we've used a lot. You know, tobacco trips have started, they've shown resistance of cotton out to neonics, uh, especially thymethoxin. Uh, that's something we got to keep in mind. The pyrethroids, everything's becoming resistant to them. They're cheap. Uh, even the newer chemistries, Pevrathon and Belt, Tomato Leaf Miner has already developed resistance. We don't use it a lot here, but we're starting to see a little slippage in, in bollworms. And that threshold I was talking about on the bollworm that we changed, we're, we're assuming you're going to get 80, 90% control from what you're using. So that threshold, if you're going to come in with a pyrethroid and get 50% control, that, that's really not what that threshold is. is is keyed in on it's keyed in and on using a, the proper insecticide to get a good 80 or 90 percent control. Uh, but keep that in mind, and we're seeing you know everybody knows that fungis, fungicides are seeing some uh, some issues. I'm, I'm out of time, so if you all got any questions, we'll uh, wind this puppy up.